Greetings and welcome to today's learning community session, the first of three sessions titled Courageous Conversations, Cultivating Cultural Humility and Managing Bi Biases with Families Facing Serious Mental Illnesses and Serious Emotional Disturbances. Before we begin, we would like to give special thanks to SAMHSA for sponsoring this presentation. There are a few housekeeping items I'd like to quickly go over. This learning community is being recorded and the recording link slides and a letter of attendance will be sent to everyone who registered and will also be available on NASHBIDS and NAMI's websites. For all questions and comments, please type them in the chat pod. If you need closed captioning today, a link is available in the chat pod as well. There will be opportunities throughout the presentation to register for session two, which is taking place next Friday, June 10th from 2 to 4 p.m. Eastern time. Please look for that information in the chat pod. Thank you again for joining us, and I will now turn this over to today's presenters, Selena Webster Bass, founder and CEO of Voices Institute, and Rachel Gator, psychologist and CEO of Peak Reachers Holistic Health, LLC. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kelly, for that introduction and welcome to our Courageous Conversations uh, webinar. Good afternoon and welcome. I am Selena Webster Bass, founder of the Voices Institute. We are a training, research, and consulting group focused on advancing health equity in historically marginalized communities. I am a health equity advocate and have worked with the system of care community for several years, and I'm delighted to co-facilitate with with Rachel Gator. Yes, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Rachel Gator. I am the CEO and founder of Peak Reachers Holistic Health, LLC, where we specialize in psychosocial rehabilitation, case management, holistic wellness coaching, and clinical training and development. I am a psychologist, and I also have the privilege of serving as the national treasurer for the Association of Black Psychologists. And we welcome you to this space today. Thank you, Rachel. We also want to acknowledge our partners uh, on this webinar, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, NAMI, and of course, SAMHSA. We want to thank you for this opportunity to share important principles and, and practices around cultural humility and addressing biases as we work with families facing serious mental illnesses. As Kelly mentioned, this is a three-part series, so we thank you for joining us today, but we'd like for you to, to continue to participate in our upcoming sessions. Uh, next Friday is our Cultivating Effective Cross-Cultural Communication, same time, uh, same place. Uh, and then our uh, next session is Healing the Wounds of Racial Stress and Trauma. And that's Friday, June the 24th uh, from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. And the registration links are in the chat box for your convenience. So these are our learning objectives for our session today. Uh, we will uh, discuss the pillars of cultural humility and the application of those principles in working with families facing uh, serious uh, mental illnesses. We'll also distinguish between implicit and explicit biases. We'll talk about microaggressions and microaffirmations. And then finally, we'll discuss uh, strategies to manage biases while working with diverse families, uh, supporting members with serious mental illnesses. So as I begin this webinar, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, that we are on ancestral grounds and that we are collectively gathered on uh, the land of our indigenous ancestors. And so we wanna respect, respectfully acknowledge all indigenous communities past, present and future. We also want to acknowledge as uh, identifying as African-American in the spirit of Sankofa, that I stand on the shoulders of my African ancestors that endured the African Holocaust in the Middle Passage. And so it's important that we uh, understand that uh, we're moving forward to healing, uh, not only from the past, but in the present and continuing on in the future. Uh, 
So while we are interacting in the chat box, we like to create gracious virtual space. And some of you may know this as safe space, but because we are talking about topics that may be deemed as uh, contentious, we want to cultivate what we call gracious space. And so these are our guidelines for gracious space. The first one is to practice controversy with civility. And so what we mean by that is we want to honor the personhood and dignity of each person that's in our virtual space today. We want to uh, demonstrate respect by being active participants in our webinar and really leaning into uh, what's shared uh, in terms of the content, but also uh, responses that may show up in our, in our chat box. Thirdly, we'd like to recognize that we are all learners and we are all teachers. So Rachel and I are facilitating this session, but we also realize that you bring uh, your expertise, your experiences and knowledge, and we'd love for you to share uh, those experiences with us through, through our uh, chat box and through some of our interactive um, activities during the session. Fourthly, we'd like to embrace discomfort. You know, a lot of times we retreat from discomfort, but that is truly the place where we grow, where we develop, and where oftentimes we are challenged. And so I encourage you to, to lean into uh, that space if you start to feel uh, uncomfortable with some of the content, because ultimately we uh, must get comfortable being uncomfortable, right, in order to move forward. Uh, we want learning to leave the space. So this is not a checkbox type training. This is really about uh, transformative work with our families, uh, within our organizations and systems. And then finally, we want to look for aha moments. And does anyone know what an aha moment, what, what that means? And if you wouldn't mind just sharing in the chat box very quickly, uh, how do you define an aha moment? What is an aha moment for you? When everything comes together in your mind, thank you so much for that, Jennifer, right? So it is that that moment uh, when the light bulb goes off, it's a realization. It's when uh, the way that we uh, practice is challenged in some way. It's a truth telling moment. It's learning something new, but it can also be a reminder of something that, that, that we may have already known. Uh, an aha moment is when you see things in light of the truth. Thank you for that, Brenda. When you better, when you have better understanding and clarity. Thank you for that. All right. So, do we have consensus for for gracious space? An eye opener. Thank you so much. When something makes good sense. And oh, I get it moment, of course. Yes, thank you. Okay, awesome. So we have consensus for gracious space. And I encourage you to use these guidelines within your organizations, in your team meetings, in your leadership meetings. And as you uh, do this work of, of uh, cultural awareness and of, of equity. Okay. So we all know that we are living through um, unprecedented times right now with uh, you know, the Buffalo, New York incident, Baldy, um, you know, what happened in Tulsa, a new event uh, that happened at a church uh, just last night, I believe. And so, you know, it's important as mental health professionals, as public health leaders, as health educators, clinicians, that we take moments for for joy. And so we would like for you to just create a word cloud with us and share with us what brings you joy. And we have a link here, uh, pollev.com forward slash Selena, S-E-L-E-N-A, W-E-B-S-T-E, 293. And that link is also in your chat box. You can copy and paste it, put it in your uh, browser, and you should receive a message saying that you joined the poll. You hit skip and then Yes, you all got it, right? So your pets bring you joy, right? That, that oxytocin, that wonderful hormone that's released when we connect with our, with our pets. Gardening, nature, reading, your dog. And feel free to use the chat box if you're not able to join the, po the poll. Puffy, clouds. 
Netflix, road trips. I love it. Family. Spending time with family, spending time with friends. Baseball, I'm seeing in the chat box. Music, family, driving my Jeep in the mountains, being near water, being near the ocean, a lake, walking in the sunshine, right? Uh, for me, I have just been taking moments to do a mindful shower, you know, as I'm showering, just taking in um, all that is around me. Um, also looking at sunsets, just simple, very simple things that, that grant us that moment of joy. Rachel, what about you? What brings you joy? Um, I would have to say my dogs, um, gardening, um, and just being able to just see sunlight, um, just being able just to get some fresh air. That is a nice booster for me. Yes. I'm seeing also church in, in the chat box. Uh, faith and spirituality is very important to me, so I can definitely connect with that. Flowers, my husband, nature books, feeling the presence of my non-physical support system. All of these are amazing. And I encourage you to just take a, a screenshot of, of these uh, moments of joy. And, and when you are overwhelmed, when you're dealing with the crisis with the family, pull up this image and think about what brings you joy and different strategies in terms of bringing ourselves ourselves joy. So thank you so much for participating in our in our word cloud. All right, so we'd like to just quickly give you a snapshot of um, health disparities, mental health disparities data uh, across youth and adults with serious uh, emotional. Uh, uh, disturbances or serious mental illnesses. And so this slide is from the Center for Behavioral Health Statistics and Quality. And it shows us that among youth aged 12 to 17 in the United States in 2019, 15.7% had at least one major depressive uh, episode in, in the past year. And when we compare uh, the national average uh, past year uh, major depressive episode it was higher among Hispanic youth and lower among non-Hispanic uh, Black youth. Compared to the national average past year, a major depressive episode or MDE was higher among youth aged 16 to 17 and lower among youth aged 12 to 13. This slide shows us uh, over a period of time from 2004 to 2019, MDEs among youth aged 12 to 17 in the US. And what we see here is that there was an increase across all groups uh, from 2004 to 2019. So um, MDE increased among youth overall, among non-Hispanic white, black, and Asian youth, and among Hispanic youth as well. When we look at accessing services or past year depression care, youth mental health and service use, and this particular slide shows data uh, across gender, race, ethnicity, as well as age group. And, and what we see here is among youth aged 12 to 17 uh, in the United States, about 43.3% received depression care in the past year. Uh, past year depression care was higher among female youth at almost 46% as compared to their male uh, counterparts at 37%. Compared to the national average, past year depression care was higher among white youth at 50% and lower among Hispanic black youth and among Hispanic, uh, I'm sorry, not Hispanic black youth and among Hispanic youth uh, at 36% and 37% respectfully. Um, compared to the national average, uh, past year depression care was lower among youth age 12 to 13 at almost 38, 38%. And I just also want to highlight that just recently, the Centers of Disease Control released uh, a report uh, specific to adolescent behaviors and experiences uh, as it relates to COVID-19. And that report showed that 37% of high school students reported they experienced poor mental health during the COVID-19 pandemic, which is no surprise to us. And 44% of high school students reported 
they persistently felt sad or hopeless during during the past year. So uh, this is 2019 data, but um, you know, based on recent studies uh, looking at um, you know uh, mental health outcomes, we do see increases across the board in terms of depression. So I'll turn it over to you, Rachel. Okay, thank you, Selena. So now we're going to look at the prevalence of any mental illness in adults. And this um, information comes from SAMHSA, and this is 2020. Um, based on the information before you, this is based on a population of 52.9 million adults age 18 or older. The prevalence of any mental illness among females was higher at 25.8% and males were at 15.8%. As it relates to the age categories, youth 18 to 25 were the highest, followed by middle adults at 26 to 49, and then with older adults from 50 and older. And those increases for the middle adult population was at 25.3%, and the older adult population was at 14.5%. Now, when we take a look at this prevalence of serious mental illness, SMI in US adults, this information also comes from SAMHSA. And you'll see this data was comprised of 14.2 million adults age 18 or older. And this population represents 5.6 of the US adults. SMI was higher among females at 7% and females led over males um, from 4 2% is how the males presented. So when you look at the difference, it was a 2.8% increase over females. As it relates to the youth category, 18 to 25 year olds had the highest prevalence um, compared to adults that were middle age. And the middle age adults um, ranging age from 26 to 49, um, were at 6.9% and older adults 50 and older were at 3.4%. And that is in comparison to the youth percentage at 9.7. Now, when we look at services received, and so this is going to be service utilization in the United States. This data also comes from SAMHSA. We're gonna take a look at gender. We're gonna also take a look at age and ethnic and racial groups. In 2020, among the 14.2 million adults with serious mental illness, 9.1 percent, excuse me, 9.1 million, which is at 64.5 percent, received some form of mental health treatment in the previous year. Now, more females at 51.2 percent received treatment versus males at 37.4 percent. And when we look at the age categories, the older adults came in at 48 percent middle adults came in at 46.6% and the young adults came in at 42.1%. Now, when we take a look at the um, percent scoring moderate to severe um, as it relates to anxiety, when we look at um, the generalized anxiety disorder scale and with the seven, um, those who aren't familiar with this scale, this scale can be used in primary care settings or behavioral health settings. There are seven questions on this questionnaire and the data that is presented before you, um, I'm not sure if you're able to see it clear. So I'm going to give you um, the populations that are represented and what color they present at. So when you look at the Asian or Pacific Islander population, they're going to present on this chart and the ones following this chart in orange. White non-Hispanics are going to present in burgundy. Black and African-American are going to present in red. Native American are going to present in green. Latino is in turquoise. And individuals who define themselves as others are going to present in navy blue. Now, if you're looking at the data that presents in pink, this is for individuals who identify with two or more ethnic groups. And so when you look at the data that is before you, um, when you look at the moderate score, that's gonna be a score of 10 or higher. And the highest score that you can receive on the GAD-7 is a 21. And so when you look at a comparison with ethnic groups, there was nearly an increase from all of the ethnic groups from the end of February to early March. And that's when um, the notification of COVID-19, the pandemic um, hit. 
all populations um, found an increase um, except for the Native American population who found an increase um, later in the year. Um, also, there was an increase towards the first week of May leading into the first week of June. For the percent scoring moderate to severe, um, as it relates to depression, the PHQ, the patient health questionnaire, has nine questions. And when you look at this questionnaire, it can be used in behavior health, our primary care settings, and the highest score um, you're going to find on this scale is going to be 27, but a moderate score starts at 15. Um, what you also may find if you're in a treatment setting where you may not have a lot of time to administer um, the assessment for the generalized anxiety, which is seven questions, the PHQ, which is nine questions, you find that sometimes people use the abbreviated um, version, the PH2, which is the first two questions of the PH9, and they use the, GA, the, the GAD2, um, which are the first two questions. And usually after they um, ask those two questions, they'll make a determination whether or not they want to do further exploration to find out whether or not this person is actually presenting with some form of anxiety um, disorder. For this slide, you will find that most of the um, ethnic populations had some form of increase, but when you look at the highest that presented um, with moderate to severe depression, you have the Native American population, followed by individuals who identify with two or more ethnic groups, and then those who classify themselves as other. Now, when we look at the percent of individuals reporting some form of suicidal ideation, and this also can include non-suicidal self-injurious behavior, the PHQ-9 was used to survey um, individuals in different ethnic groups. And for um, 2020, um, it found that since the end of May and early June, that nearly every racial ethnic group experienced a higher rate of suicidal ideation um, in, than in 2019, except for the Native American population, and their increase was found in July. Um, the increase also um, for Native Americans, they were the highest ethnic group in 2020 that had an increase in suicidal um, ideations um, and followed by the Native American population who had an increase at 9.5. You had individuals who identified as non-Hispanic, Black or African American, they had an increase at 6.89%. Now, when we look at age adjusted suicide rates by age and ethnicity, this is over a 10 year span. And so when you find the longitudinal studies, a lot of times we can see that there may be an increase or a, de a decrease with certain ethnic populations. Um, again, I know that there may be some difficulty seeing the color, so I will give you the highlights um, for this data. Um, the first ethnic group that came in high with um, the suicide um, rates from a 10 year span were the non-Hispanic American Indian Native Alaskan population, followed by the non-Hispanic white. Then you had third, the Hispanic Latino population, and then fourth, the non-Hispanic Black African American population. And if you notice the turquoise um, line that is on this chart, this represents the total as far as all five ethnic groups that are um, presented um, for data. And for the crude suicide rate among male youth age 15 to 24, and this data also gives a um, snapshot based on race and ethnicity you'll find that the highest was the non-Hispanic um, American Indian Native Alaskan population, next followed by the non-white Hispanic, and then third, the non-Hispanic Black African American um, population. And then you have the Latino um, Hispanic population. And again, like the previous slide, the turquoise line that you see represents all five ethnic groups presented on this slide. 
In addition to this information that you see, the Congressional Black Caucus had an emergency task force on Black youth suicide and mental health that provided um, refreshed data. And then also you'll see towards the end of the presentation, um, we're going to show you some resources for different ethnic groups if you're looking for just some insight on how to provide culturally relevant care to them. Um, in 2019, the Congressional Black Caucus contacted um, all of the ethnic psychological associations. And so that's for the indigenous population, the Asian American population, Latina X, um, and the Association of Black Psychologists came together and created a COVID-19 needs assessment. And the um, with, and this um, coalition is called the Alliance. And when there is a need or a request for um, data on ethnic populations as it relates to um, behavioral health or substance use, they will reach out to those different associations. And what we did is we created um, one um, assessment tool that we used in different populations. And then we came together to do a comparison on what the data yielded. And what we found was it wasn't that much of a difference in the data, but how individuals responded to care and how they defined what they looked at as helpful services um, did vary. If you would like some information on that, that information, that report was um, comprised um, by the different um, associations and it is housed with the National Black Caucus. And I encourage you to utilize um, those resources for different, different ethnic groups um, associations, if you just want to have some peer reviewed data, and especially if you want to have something um, that is more current. Thank you, Selena. Thank you, Rachel. And I saw in the chat box that we uh, had a request uh, specifically around the lesbian, gay, bisexual uh, population. I said it's upcoming. So here it is. So this data uh, shows. Uh, for period 2015 to 2019, an increase in serious mental illness for the lesbian, gay, bisexual population across various age groups. So uh, from 18 to 25 years of age, to 26 to 49 years of age, and then to 18 uh, years of age and above, we see an increase. And then we see a drop actually in those individuals that are uh, over 50 years of age. We also see highlighted on this slide gaps in treatment. So those 62% of LGB uh, young adults received treatment, 38% did not receive treatment. Uh, you know, for LGB adults age 26 to 49, 72% received treatment, uh, but uh, almost 30% did not receive treatment. So we still see gaps in terms of care for the LGB uh, and non-gender conforming um, uh, cultural group. This particular slide shows an increase in major depressive episode with severe impairment from 2016 through uh, 2009. And you can see the trend is upward, uh, both for male and female, although we see that more females that are part of this group are affected than males um, based on uh, this, this particular study. And then uh, in terms of individuals greater than 26 years of age, uh, that identify as LGB adults. Uh, again, we see an upward trend between 2016 and 2019 and greater increases for both uh, for male for females uh, than males in both in both categories. And, and when we mention severe impairment, we're uh, speaking of the level of impairment that impacts one's home management, you know, being able to carry out those normal activities of work, of close relationships relationships with uh, family, friends, and, uh, you know, having those social, those social connections. Um, the study that I mentioned earlier, the Centers for Disease Control uh, survey that was administered with adolescent behaviors uh, and experiences, the AIDS survey also um, collected data uh, from the LGB uh, youth. And what they found is that uh, female youth reported greater levels of poor mental health, and this is during the period of COVID-19, uh, emotional abuse by a parent or caregiver and having attempted suicide than uh, their heterosexual uh, counterparts. And so we know that um, some of these health outcomes that we see in the LGB uh, community 
is rooted in discrimination and stigma and victimization from childhood and, and adolescence. So it's really important that as we show this data, one, that we realize that there are individual uh, families, there are individuals uh, that are behind these numbers, you know, we're looking at aggregated numbers, but these are uh, representative of the lived experiences of folks. And so it's important that we focus on protective factors, that positive uh, home environment, school connectedness and cohesion, uh, positive cultural identity, um, creating communities of support, right? And even the role of faith and spirituality and community involvement are important protective factors in addressing uh, some of the uh, mental health disparities that we just uh, shared. And there's a question regarding new data with LGB for uh, 2020. Uh, there is some data from the Trevor Project uh, from Gilson. And so we have a couple of those links in, in the resources section. So we'll be glad to forward those links to you. So many of the out health outcomes that we just shared are impacted by what we call social determinants of health. And these are the conditions in which people live, where they work, where they age. And uh, we know that zip code matters, where people live, what they're experiencing in terms of community violence, whether they have access to healthy foods, um, whether they feel a sense of connectedness to community impacts one's uh, mental, mental well-being. And so uh, it's really important that as uh, mental health professionals and as public health leaders that we use a biopsychosocial model uh, in thinking about uh, mental health. And so these are some of the domains that we think about uh, in terms of social determinants of health, uh, economic stability, whether people are employed or not, um, neighborhood and the physical environment, the type of housing people are, um, where, where they reside, whether they have access to transportation. So the built environment impacts uh, health outcomes in terms of, of mental well-being. And, and so the list goes on here in terms of education, food, community and safety, but certain, certainly the healthcare system, the behavioral health system, the mental health system uh, is an important social determinant of health in terms of one, do people have uh, coverage in terms of insurance, right? And not just coverage, but is it adequate coverage, right? Are there enough visits uh, you know, for the year to address whatever the, the mental health need is, right? Provider and pharmacy availability, how far do individuals have to travel in order to um, access services? Whether those services are provided in a way where the patient feels or the client or the individual feels honored, feels respected, you know, are there language access barriers in terms of, of the service that's being received, right? So all of these social determinants of health are really important in terms of, of mental health outcomes. Uh, when we think about social determinants of health specific to uh, mental illness, uh, in the literature, there's a list um, of factors specific to exposure to violence, uh, conflict or war, mass incarceration, um, relations with law enforcement and communities, uh, environmental factors, uh, experiences with racism and discrimination, adverse childhood experiences, all of these are direct connections to, to mental health outcomes uh, as, as correlated with social determinants of health. So we can't talk about um, social determinants of health and uh, those factors that influence uh, mental health outcomes without also talking about history, right? And so James Baldwin uh, has this quote that says, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. And so it's really important that we understand the role of history, honest history uh, in terms of, of health disparities and health inequities, right? So race is a short word with a long history. And we know that the truth of the matter is that America was established through the exploitation, the extermination, and the oppression of BIPOC or Black people, Indigenous groups, and people of color. And these racist uh, ideas were created to justify brutal practices. And BIPOC 
was deemed as inferior and white superior for economic gain and colonial power. And so this past is also part of our present. And so as we think about barriers and eliminating barriers to access, it's important that we uh, know where we have been in order to move to move forward. So, you know, um, his historical trauma is, is part of that history. So the lacerations, the wounding, the collective trauma across BIPOC, BIPOC communities has impacted um, communities of, of, of color, uh, specifically in terms of structural racism, such as redlining, uh, the disinvestment of communities in terms of schools and, and many of the differences in health outcomes that, that we see. And so we see the downward uh, spiral in terms of the history, for example, with African Americans, chattel slavery or enslavement, with Jim Crow laws, um, mass incarceration, the disinvestment in communities, the intergenerational trauma, and uh, leading on to uh, those, those racial and health disparities. And so it's really important that we are advocates for health equity, right, where everyone has a fair opportunity to live a long and healthy life. So this is an image that we often use to distinguish between equity versus equality. And equality means that, you know, each individual receives the same resources and opportunities. So it's like a one size fits all approach. But equity recognizes that each person has different circumstances and allocates resources and opportunities to reach an equal outcome. So if we're working with a family, right, one family may need wraparound care coordination services. One family may need uh, peer support partners. A family may need assistance with transportation, right? So, so each family is unique. Each family is different and has um, specific needs. And so it's important to recognize that as we are working with, with our families, right? And so equality here, we see that, you know, Everyone's receiving the same thing. They have the, the same standing here with equity. We see that there are some adjustments made so that individuals can be more active participants in their uh, mental health care. But then our third box here is called liberation, right? And the, the wall, the barriers are, are removed. And that's really our goal as, as professionals, as clinicians, is to assist our families in eliminating those barriers to access. So uh, a couple of questions here. What are some of the barriers that your families are facing in terms of accessing mental health services? And feel free to type in in the chat box. I see some comments here. Yes, liberation. How can we remove the barriers and correct our systems? Okay. So, all right. So barrier stigma, provider shortage. Yes, financial, availability of services in rural communities, policies, lack of providers taking state insurance, lack of knowledge of systems and services, stigma. Okay. So this list is comprehensive. What I like about this list is that it thinks about barriers from the micro level in terms of what individual uh, families may face in accessing services, but also from a systems and organizational and policy perspective. So the macro uh, perspective in terms of um, challenges in uh, accessing uh, mental health mental health services. And I'm seeing the list here, mistrust of medical professionals, very long wait list, telehealth is terrible, right? So yeah, so these are all major barriers that we should address in our organizations. At the individual level, it's important that we're sharing power with our families. And we do that by allowing them to talk about their lived experiences. We do that by allowing them to identify you know, um, their, their cultural background as they define it. And then allowing uh, our, our uh, families to um, describe what that means for them in terms of their identity, right? So, so really amplifying the voices of families, that's important, right? Um, and then in terms of our organizations, you know, what are our hours? Are our hours consistent 
or, or convenient for our, our families, right? So looking at organizational issues, how long does a, a family or individual have to wait before they get an appointment, right? So oftentimes we have gaps in services. And so creative um, partnering with primary care providers, collaborative care models is a way to address that. So it's important that within our communities that we have committees and task force where one, we identify what the barrier is and we identify solutions in terms of addressing those barriers. We have a second question here about the wall. How did the wall get there? Um, and feel free to respond in the chat box. But we know again that the wall is from a historical perspective is connected to um, history and a legacy of, of, of differences in terms of the provision of services, right? And we also know that historically, uh, there have been uh, issues, for example, the Tuskegee experiment, where um, there was mistrust of, of our systems, mistrust of the healthcare system, right? And so, um, so those are some of the historical perspectives in terms of the wall. Um, but in terms of the individual, there may be uh, cultural health beliefs, right? Around seeking out mental health services. You know, is it viewed as personal weakness when I seek mental health services? Uh, is there a cultural stigma associated with that? Um, so seeing lots of wonderful comments in our chat box, the lack of late hours for families who struggle. Absolutely. Um, I managed a sickle cell clinic for several years and we were having very high uh, no-show rates and we conducted a survey and we found that it was indeed our hours, you know, and our hours were in the mornings. We didn't even have afternoon appointments, right? And so it's important that we don't make assumptions, but we elicit information from our families to understand uh, the barriers, right? So any ideas for our fourth box? How would you describe um, our fourth box? What would you like to see in terms of the next phase after liberation? Describe your fourth box and feel free to type that. Yes, Jennifer, thank you. So uh, not on the sidelines. We don't want our families on the sidelines, but we want them to be active participants in, in their health care um, in their healthcare planning, right? Families leading, absolutely. Integration, we can play in the game, absolutely. So uh, wonderful, and thank you all so much for your comments. And I encourage you to, uh, you know, get with your mental health task force, with your NAMI organization and your community, and really discuss, you know, viable solutions in terms of addressing barriers, uh, whether they're geographical barriers, transportation barriers, you know, how can we leverage services in our community so that uh, we are doing a better job of providing access and better quality and respectful and culturally responsive services? Okay. So one of the ways that we remove barriers is by providing culturally responsive services or culturally competent services or being culturally competent providers. And so we define cultural competence as the ability to work effectively across differences. And so cultural competence is about, you know, um, uh, you know, understanding cultural health beliefs understanding that some families may come from a non-biomedical model, right? They may come from more of a, a spiritual model, right? Um, a psychosocial perspective versus um, a traditional medical model, right? Understanding the role of faith and spirituality, um, understanding generational differences um, that may impact uh, health-seeking uh, behaviors, and also understanding the histories and experiences of marginalized communities in terms of seeking healthcare services. We can also think about cultural competence from an organizational perspective. You know, what are our policies around non-discrimination? What are our policies around language access? If someone calls to the agency or to the organization, you know, does the staff know how to access the services, right? Um, do our families knew, know that services are, are free and um, that these are services that uh, will be provided and that a family member should not be used as a um, interpreter uh, for, for their visits, right? So, so these are important conversations that should be had within the organization. Looking at uh, the diversity within the organization, and not just at the direct service level, but in the leadership, uh, at the leadership level as well. 
Uh, also, uh, looking at our data, examining uh, our disparities data, looking at patterns across periods of time, uh, reviewing our patient engagement or our client or family engagement surveys, satisfaction surveys. All of these are action steps towards becoming a more culturally responsive organization. Um, so cultural competence is, is about the knowing. Right? It's about uh, knowing you know, cultural beliefs and practices and respecting those cultural beliefs and, and practices. Cultural humility is about the unknowing. Right, It's saying that I don't know everything there is to know about every individual, but I am willing to learn. Right, And so that requires reflective practice. It requires self-awareness, self-evaluation, and self-critique. And so that is the first pillar of cultural humility, is establishing um, oneself as a lifelong learner and self-evaluation. The second pillar is fixing power and balance, meaning that we're sharing power because just by virtue of being a provider or clinician or professional, there is a, a power dynamic there. There is a power imbalance. And so fixing that power imbalance by making sure that we allow the family to be an active participant in their, in their care. Um, and committing to institutional accountability. Again, focusing on the national, culturally, and linguistically appropriate services standards. These are 15 action steps in terms of making sure our organizations are responsive to the needs of, of our families. Okay, so this is just a Venn, di a Venn diagram that shows the differences between cultural competence and cultural humility. Again, I want to focus on the cultural humility component and the importance of self-reflection, of vulnerability, of curiosity, of being vulnerable, you know, because as professionals, we want to know it all, right? But cultural humility says, you know, I don't know it all. And so I want to ask this particular family what their experiences are. And you know how do they define mental illness? You know, understanding disease causation. So it's really about the unknowing and uh, allowing the family to drive the experience. So I'll turn it over to uh, Rachel. We have a video that's focused on examining bias and practicing cultural humility. Okay, thank you, Selena. We're going to take a look at a video, um, and this is going to be um, a clinician. Um, that's going to receive a call in reference to her client and then she's going to get some assistance from her co-worker to provide her um, you know an opportunity to do some self-reflection to determine how she can effectively provide care to this family I just want to verify when her last appointment was. So she missed one appointment or? Okay, two. Wow. Thanks. You too. Ashley? Oh, hi. Are you okay? I'm fine. It's been such a rough day. I just got back from a tough home visit. What's up? I was just stopping by to give you back this file. Do you have a moment to talk about the home visit? Yeah, sure. So tell me what's going on. I had a home visit with a client who recently stopped coming to the outpatient treatment program for opioid addiction. I drove over an hour to meet with this woman. I step into her trailer and she won't even look me in the eyes. All she gives me are one-word answers and everything is a mess. She stopped taking buprenorphine, missed her last two appointments that I set up for her here, and it's pretty clear to me that she's still using. Oh, it's so frustrating working with addicts. I just don't know how to get through to her. All I want is for her baby to be born healthy. I'm trying to get this woman treatment so she'll have the chance to keep custody of her child, but she doesn't care. Okay, I can tell this is upsetting. And I know it's difficult working with individuals with opioid addictions. Some of your colleagues have shared similar frustrations, but I think there's more here we need to discuss. Now, we will have to get to our team meeting. 
but I'd like to schedule some time to talk more. When is your next meeting? Uh, next week on Wednesday. Okay, let's try to check in before then. Sure, thanks. Let's see how Ashley and Caroline's next conversation goes. Ashley, I was concerned about the conversation we had earlier this week about your home visit. I know work is hectic for everyone, but I want you to know that I hear your frustrations. Thanks. I think I was just having a bad day. Maybe, but I want to help you improve your relationship with this client. I appreciate that, but I don't know if this one client is the problem. I think I'm overwhelmed. When I started working here, I didn't expect to deal with the opioid crisis 24-7, but now I feel like it's all I do. I've worked with clients who face tough situations before, but usually working with pregnant women and new mothers is more hopeful. I mean, they want what's best for their children, you know? It's incredibly frustrating to work with a client who seems like they don't care about the future and have no interest in changing, even when their unborn baby's health is at stake. Tell me a little more about why you think this client does not have any interest in changing. What social or environmental barriers have you considered that may be affecting her ad adherence to treatment? I got the impression that she didn't care about anything as soon as I stepped inside her trailer. Everything was dirty and broken, no effort to clean up or fix anything. She was so detached and avoidant. And I've considered that her lack of stable housing and reliable transportation may be barriers for her, but I'm not confident that even if we found her a reliable mode of transportation, that she's interested in getting any help. I just wish she cared. Let's take a step back for a second. It seems to me that you are making some assumptions about your client based on her socioeconomic status. This may be affecting your ability to understand the factors that are preventing your client from maintaining a healthy pregnancy. Have you noticed any class differences between you and your client? Okay, when we look at that interaction between the clinician and her colleague um, and some of the barriers that the clinician as well as her coworker identified, what could be the next step for the clinician to assist the family? If you can put those in the chat. And yes, I see where I got the, the impression and this um, can be very dangerous um, going into a clinical setting, making assumptions about a client's, you know, willing um, and willingness and ability to, um, I know just as a clinician, one of the things that I used to assume was if a person was sitting in front of me that they're ready, let's get this treatment, you know, started. But I had to remember that sometimes um, clients, um, families, or, you know, members come um, for services, and it may be a third-party referral. And so when I think of the stages of change, when Prochaska and De Clemente came up with that stages of change model, it was very helpful, not only when I was talking to um, um, someone that I was providing services to, I educated them on the model. And then we look at, you know, where did they, you know, see themselves um, as it related to um, the stage of change. And, you know, even with us as individuals, we can find ourselves fluctuating between different stages, especially when it comes to our comfortability level, um, our ability to know that we can be successful at something. And so, um, a lot of the stereotypes and misconceptions that the clinician went into that treatment situation with that um, particular family um, created barriers that may not have even been present. And so that's why it's very, very important that as um, clinicians, because we are people and we have our own ideas of things that we have to make sure that we provide um, services 
um, to individuals um, and meet them where they are. Um, we know that if we are in the driver's seat as it relates to treatment and our person that we're providing services to is in the passenger seat, the odds of us being successful are kind of slim. We have to allow them to feel empowered and take ownership of what takes place. Um, and sometimes we want to put on that cape and be that super clinician that, you know, every session is successful and they've achieved some treatment, you know, plan goals. But sometimes we're just providing psychosocial education, you know, getting some insight to, you know, what that um, person is experiencing. Because coming to someone and asking them to assist you in something, whether it is big or small, in our eyes or that person's eyes is big. That is one of the most humbling things to do is to ask someone to assist you. Then when we put um, and think of cultural considerations where everything that this person was raised to believe defies what they're doing with you because we keep things in house or we talk to the village or we talk to the family or you know we have our own internal way of managing things now you want me to put my belief system on hold and come to you who has all these misconceptions of why I'm presenting to you. And so sometimes your first five to 10 minutes is just merely having an opportunity to get to know who's sitting before you. If your organization has a psychosocial examination, um, it's helpful to read that information before you go into that first appointment just to get some insight. And then you can go and do a brief psychosocial um, interview and you can do it in a conversation style so that person doesn't feel as if I already answered these questions for the person at the front desk. One thing that I um, was able to master and it took me a while is I tried not to write when I was working um, with people because I felt as if it made it feel very formal and structured. So I would let them know that there will be brief pauses that I would take just to make sure that I captured what they shared with me. So I could take my time and really engage, provide, you know, eye contact, you know, give them a sense of that I was present during that session and they wouldn't feel as if I was just taking down a whole bunch of notes and doing a bunch of typing. So even some things that we do that are just administratively, just things that come second nature to us may even create unintentional barriers. So it's not something that we're doing intentionally because we're trying to provide service, but understanding what makes that person comfortable when someone is working with them through something that is something that is sensitive in nature. And then also thinking of some of the misconceptions that we have when we work with different populations. Thank you so much, Rachel. We had lots of wonderful comments in the uh, chat box around the cultural formulation interview, which we are covering in our next session as a tool for uh, eliciting information. But one of the things that I see across uh, the comments in the chat box is asking the, the, the client, asking the family or individual um, about what works for them or asking them specifically about what motivates them or what are the barriers and how can I assist or support you in, uh, in eliminating those barriers. So that's that's some of the things that we're seeing here. Um, and, and I think another um, point from, from the video is that uh, the, the professional had lots of preconceived notions, right? Lots of assumptions and generalizations based on, uh, based on class, right? And so again, cultural humility goes back to, you know, evaluating and reflecting on who we are in our own cultural autobiographies and how that plays in or how that impacts our interaction with, with families. So, so these are some examples of some questions that you may um, you know, ask yourself in terms of being more a more culturally humble professional. And I'm just gonna uh, you know, 
go through a couple of these, you know, are you aware of your biases or your prejudices? And if so, how are you dealing with them? How do your values and beliefs influence the way you interact with the community? Do you give your colleagues and community members respectful consideration regardless of their socioeconomic status? their cultural, their ethnic background, or even their, their uh, immigrant status, right? So it's important for us to, you know, really do that self-assessment. Did we grow up in a homogenous community or did we grow up in a heterogeneous community, right? Did we have lots of intergroup contact um, in, in, our, uh, in, our, uh, in our own experiences? So, so that uh, reflection process is really important in terms of being a culturally humble provider. So, um, so here is our definition of culture. Our culture uh, is the lens through which we see the world. It's a set of guidelines uh, that uh, impact the way that we experience life, how we interact with others, um, how we survive, right, in our environments, right? And so I'm not sure if you all took a look at this image over here. Some of you may have seen uh, the baby first. Some of you may have seen the people first. But the point of the image is that culture is the lens through which we see the world. It's how we make sense of the world. And so this is our cultural iceberg. And oftentimes we focus a lot on, on the visible, on what's seen, right? Like, you know, the, the dress, the attire, right? Or skin color even, right? And we make assumptions based on those visible factors. But really what's most important is what's below the iceberg, those beliefs and assumptions around uh, mental illness and and understanding uh, how mental illness is defined by by the individual. And so this requires deeper, deeper knowledge and deeper assessment and understanding uh, strengths and in uh, understanding um, culture. And so a cultural assessment is really important in terms of getting below below the surface. So this is Hayes addressing model. And this model uh, is a way for us to conceptualize the complexities of identity. And so uh, addressing stands for uh, age, developmental disability, disability, the R for religion, E for ethnic identity and race, S for sexual orientation, S for social economic status, status, I for indigenous, uh, N for national origin and G for, for gender. So this first column represents uh, cultural influences. The second column represents uh, the individuals who typically have power uh, in that particular category. The third column represents individuals who typically in American culture have, have less power. And then the fourth column is how we name uh, the differences that we see in terms of power uh, across these categories. So we have ageism and ableism and ethnocentrism, the belief that one group is superior to another group, uh, racism, heterosexism, classism, uh, ethnocentrism, and sexism. And if I could add another, I would put um, another uh, bar here that has professionals and, and families because there, there's a power dynamic there as well. Or even our, our Jewish community could be included on this model as well. And so it's important again that we are sharing uh, that we're sharing power and that we're mapping our own constellation of privilege, that we're thinking about where do I fall in these different categories and how does my identity impact the interactions that I have with, with those that I, I'm serving, right? And typically we have more knowledge if we're in a position of power, we have more knowledge about our group versus the corresponding uh, marginalized group, right? So it's important that we're mapping our constellation of privilege and using our privilege to advocate for, for a historically marginalized populations. The other thing that, uh, the addressing model uh, highlights is the intersectionality of identity. And so we have these overlapping and intersecting of identities. And uh, these identities, they don't exist in a vacuum. And oftentimes individuals may be part of several marginalized groups or several privileged groups. But when we think about um, serving individuals who uh, may be marginalized, you know, it's important for us to keep in mind uh, the double and triple stigmatization. So yes, I 
am living with a serious mental illness, but I'm also identifying as a Hispanic female, right? And so that's three layers of, of marginalization. And so how does that impact uh, the way that I seek healthcare services, and how does that impact the way that I connect with, with my provider? So it's important that we're aware of this intersectionality of identity as well. I love this quote by Maya Angelou that says, we should all know that diversity makes for a rich tapestry, and we must understand that all the threads of the tapestry are equal in value, no matter what the color. Okay. All right, so we like to show you another video. We're moving into our implicit and explicit bias uh, session. And I'd just like to pause for just a moment to check in and make sure everyone's okay on our, on our webinar and see if there are any questions uh, in the chat box before we start our, our video. Okay. okay, so this video uh, is or can be triggering. And so I just want to prepare you. Um, the video does resolve. Um, and there are some uh, startling sounds at the beginning, but uh, we'll talk about those sounds at the end. Uh, but we'd love for you to just engage in this video and really take um, time to um, watch because there's no speaking during the video and to watch the responses of the three characters uh, in silence. Beats video. There's a young African American male, there's a shop owner, and then there's an, an elderly uh, white woman. And so we'd like for you to take a look and, and to reflect.
I always have to let that video just settle, no matter how many times I, I see. So what are your responses to the video? What are your reactions to the video? Type that in the chat box. I see some references to uh, George Floyd. Um, the talk that oftentimes uh, parents of color have, have with their kids to make sure that um, their interaction with police doesn't escalate. I see, wow, a stark reality, very sad. Uh, my youth. What what are some of the isms that you saw in this video? What are some of the isms? I see it actually makes me sad because I know people see my young adult children the same way. Tammy says ageism, racism. Right. So this young man uh, possibly was judged by his race. Um, judged by class, classism, his age, ageism. So all of those different forms of discrimination are compounded, right? So this is what we mean by intersectionality uh, and, and how that impacts the everyday lived experiences of the families that we're serving in, in communities. Stigmatism, heartbreak, absolutely. Yes, you did see the lady still a Snickers at the end. Right. Yeah. How many of you thought that the, the sounds at the beginning were gunshots? Right. And so it was actually this young man tap dancing. Right? So this was a non stereotypical view of an African American male. Right. Uh, I see. I also live in a neighborhood that is so prevalent and real. My children are also judged by their race. And then their mom comes in behind them and folks change their their attitudes. Okay, so this, again, is the reality of the racial stress and trauma that uh, BIPOC communities experience day in and day out. And we'll, we'll go deeper into uh, racial stress and trauma in our third session. But we saw all kinds of biases at work here, right? We saw lots of assumptions being made about this young man. We also saw assumptions being made about the shopkeeper and about the uh, senior woman as well, right? Um, and, and there wasn't an alignment with reality. This young man was not um, a thug, as we would say, but he was a caretaker for his mother. He was, um, you know, had had some type of spiritual experience. He uh, was uh, there to pay for his, his, his goods, just like uh, any other person, right? And, and he also had this amazing strength, this talent of tap dancing, right? So, um, so this, this video is in, a reminder for us to uh, make sure that we are managing our biases and that we are to question and challenge the assumptions that we, we often have about groups that may be different than ourselves. So I'll turn it over to you, Rachel. Okay, thank you, Sue. And then now we're gonna take a look at explicit bias and explicit biases are those beliefs that are held or endorsed on a conscious level. So you have a level of awareness. For example, youth of color that are denied opportunities for diversionary programs because the belief about culpability. And when we think about um, the explicit biases and we think of providing services, when we even see a, a person's name come across um, our desk, um, sometimes people can just make an assumption on that person's race or ethnicity um, based on either the box that they checked or the name um, that is presented. And so those are some things that we want to be mindful of is that before we provide any care that we are mindful of some of the biases that we um, possess. For example, um, if you work in different communities, you just may make an assumption um, that um, everyone um, wants to go to a particular provider that is closer to them. Um, and that was an assumption that I made because I assumed that individuals wanted to provide, wanted to receive care at the facility that was closest to them for convenience. And then I was told, no, Miss Rachel, I don't want these people knowing my business, people in the neighborhood, you know, we kind of see who goes in and out that center. I would prefer to go to, you know, facility 
across town, even if I have to catch one or two buses. And so I made the assumption that based on geographic location that this person wanted something that was convenient, whereas they wanted to have a level of confidentiality and privacy. And so when we think about the stigma that's associated with behavior health, and I'm not sure of where your um, particular agency sits in your community, but sometimes we are at the only facility in that particular county or in that particular zip code. And so what we do want to um, ensure is that anyone that we're providing services to, that there is going to be a level of confidentiality that is going to be maintained um, while providing them services, especially if you're in a smaller area. Um, we're in Jacksonville, but we call it a big city, but a small town. And sometimes you have multiple relationships. And so there may be a possibility that you're providing care for someone who um, looks at you, of course, we know about the balance of power, um, someone of authority, but they have to maybe go and see you at church on Sunday. They attend your church or you know, their children attend the same schools that your children attend. So you also want to make sure that that person knows that you see them as a person, that they're not just a person receiving services um, and that you want to provide them quality care um, no matter what stage um, they present in. And we look at implicit bias. These are subconscious attitudes or stereotypes that, are effective, that affect our understanding, actions, and decisions in an unconscious manner. And so this could be um, just assuming that males are better leaders um, than women um, during a hiring process. Also, when we think about media, things that we are constantly exposed to, um, it can also shape or just even um, reinforce belief systems. So uh, making sure that you have a diverse circle. And so I say this, that it's very um, beneficial to have a diverse professional group and social group, because there are gonna be times where people may come and ask you a question because they know you belong to a particular group and they just wanna have you know, a candid answer. Um, I would let my friends know if they had questions about you know, Black or African-American populations that I was okay with them asking me certain questions in a respectful manner to provide them some clarification. Because sometimes we know that diversity only can happen if we interact outside of our professional circle or outside of our communities because we may live in homogenous um, populations. But um, not being afraid to ask uncomfortable questions to provide relevant care to the populations we serve. Um, and don't always assume because a person belongs to one population that they're the expert um, in that particular race or ethnic group. Because we know geographically can influence, um, ge um, geography can influence how people believe um, certain um, things, um, sometimes um, just as much as race or ethnicity. And so we want to not just make an assumption that because a person belongs to a person, you know, a particular group, and because I read a few peer reviewed articles, this is going to be the best approach, you know, just have a conversation with that person to find out, is it best for me to speak to you verbally? Do you prefer for me to provide you um, written, um, you know, um, treatment plans, um, and if there's someone that's a part of your support group, what is the best way for them to provide you care? Because we know that some communities um, believe in the village mo model. And so, you know, it's, you know, families, um, church community, um, people that are stakeholders in the community, all of these individuals are going to be providing this person support during the treatment process. And so we want to make sure that not only when we're speaking to the client, we're speaking to the, the person that we're providing services to, that we're speaking in a way that not only they can understand, but we provide them documentation to support, su to support their treatment planning that is clear. Um, that we don't use a lot of acronyms and we use um, plain language and we also provide a level of accessibility if there ever is a crisis or they just need some support services outside of that normal treatment appointment. And when we think of the attributes of bias, everyone has bias, but it's how um, we manage those biases. And that's a lifelong process. Um, and we also want to be mindful that bias can also affect how we perceive, relate, and act in the world. And it is critical to our effectiveness. And bias can do um, one or two things. It can either impede or it can enhance 
um, the relationship that we not only have with colleagues, clients and families. And I saw in the chat where there was some conversation about, you know, clients or excuse me, people that are provide, you're providing care to, they know whether or not you care. And just how we know ourselves and we know our colleagues, we know that treatment starts at the time that that person makes contact with the agency, whether it's over the phone or the receptionist. And so um, when they are in that um, reception space waiting for their appointment, how does it look? Do they see a level of inclusivity or do they feel as if they're going to a particular agency that only treats a certain population because they don't see either staff or other individuals receiving services that look like them. And so having um, diversity, not only with your staff, but also in the treatment population also can provide um, an ability for you to understand who you're providing services to. If your agency doesn't have um, a peer support network, um, I would encourage you to look at establishing one because sometimes we know, especially when you're working with individuals um, in substance use um, programs, that that sponsor has just as much or even more power than the provider. And so them having real life experiences, seeing individuals who have graduated from services and that are providing them some emotional support can also assist you in providing the quality care that um, you know that you can provide the um, client. And these are some of the factors that can influence um, bias early childhood experiences. And so you may even ask um, the person you're providing services to, to describe their childhood or describe the neighborhood they live in or what neighborhood that they enjoy living in the most. What was it about that neighborhood that they enjoyed? Just to get some insight on what makes them comfortable and understanding that certain emotional states can make biases worse, especially when we look at stigmatized groups. And so when we look at the news or we look at our own local news, you know, when they say that something has happened on a particular side of town, you know, unfortunately those biases may come and we say, mm, we know, you know, where that crime was perpetrated. We probably have an idea of what we think that person looks like and we could be completely wrong. Just understanding that those individuals live in environments that they love. And so the negative talk or the negative perception that you have is their community that they're very prideful of. And when I thought about the video, when the clinician spoke about how that person's um, home was in disarray, I think about even if that person's home was in disarray, that's their home and it's comfortable for them. And so if you are making home visits, making sure that you um, are coming into um, someone's home, which is major for someone to invite you into their personal space, to make sure that you don't provide unsolicited feedback on how they keep their home unless they ask you for recommendations. And then for ambiguity, you know, critical, um, when we think about the criteria of when it's, um, when processing information that sometimes if we don't get enough information, we'll create our own narrative, we'll make our own story. And so asking questions to make sure that we're making a valid um, conscious decision and not just making a decision based on stereotypes or just previous interactions. And then the implicit um, association test, this is offered by the University of Virginia. And if you go to the website to take the test, they'll have you um, accept a disclaimer. Um, there is some controversy um, associated with this test because they state that it does not have the ability to really predict bias. But it is, an, uh, it is a tool that you could use um, as a self-assessment. Um, this um, self-assessment tool um, gives um, different um, tests to um, test your ability to either make um, just a decision based on what you see, or do you make an unsubconscious decision um, based on race, mental health, sexuality, um, gender, and age. Then when we look at managing biases, um, this is um, when we do our own work. And so as a clinician, you know, it's easy to tell other people what they need to do, how they need to do it, monitor the outcomes, whether or not they're making any change, whether or not they're making any progress. But we also always have to do 
self-reflection. Um, one thing that may um, be um, helpful for you between appointments is interactive journaling. If you just want to write down your thoughts and then at the end of the day, you go back and you look at your journal and you may have found yourself um, finding um, a little bit more light at the end of the tunnel. You may find yourself being hopeful. Um, as a clinician, if you're working for you know, a state funded facility or a private facility, sometimes the caseload is high, but the time is very low to really manage your caseload effectively and you know, to provide the care that you feel as if the, the, the clients deserve. And so finding um, time between appointments, whether it's taking you know, a five minute break, whether it's doing some journaling, just doing some self checking, um, just so you don't find yourself overwhelmed. Um, after a while, you may even find um, after a person is discharged, you may be treating them again. And so you don't want to just assume that they're presenting with the same thing that they presented with previously when you assisted them. And just speaking to your coworkers, if you have one-to-ones with your supervisor, if you have a treatment team meeting, you know, being open um, about some of the difficulties that you may be facing while working with certain um, cases, what I would find helpful in treatment plan meeting is that you may have someone that may not really want to talk to you, but they talk to the dietitian or they talk to the nurse. So finding out who that person feels most comfortable with and asking um, the client if they're comfortable with um, having that person be a part of the treatment process. Of course, you'll have the consent um, form signed, but having that consent form signed and getting some um, additional information on culture um, will give you some insight to know whether or not this person is presenting with something that's related on the behavioral health side, or is it something that's, that they're experiencing or that they're expressing themselves culturally? Um, because, you know, as clinicians, sometimes we zoom in, we look at clinical pre presentation and we're ready to diagnose. And sometimes um, that should be secondary um, when it comes to whether or not this person is presenting with a behavioral health diagnosis, we need to shift our focus and do our cultural rule outs first and then shift over to um, if it's something that's related on the behavior health side and making sure that when we do start addressing the behavior health, that we do it in a culturally sensitive manner that that person is comfortable with and also that we make treatment recommendations that do not conflict with that individual's cultural beliefs systems. Thank and you so much, Rachel. For microaggressions, anytime. Yes. So uh, Rachel has talked about managing biases. And so uh, this work of being a culturally responsive, culturally humble professional is really deep soul work, as I call it, right? And so one of the terms that you may have heard is um, uh, microaggressions. And these are subtle indignities that uh, are disparaging to uh, historically marginalized populations. A lot of times we think about microaggressions in terms of race, but there can also be microaggressions in terms of mental illness, in terms of uh, soji, sexual orientation and gender identity and expression, in terms of religion, spirituality. So all of those categories that were listed on uh, Hayes addressing model, um, a microaggression may be applied. And so um, interesting enough, a lot of times when we think about microaggressions, we think of verbal exchanges, but microaggressions can be verbal, behavioral, and environmental as well, right? And so here are some examples of uh, verbal microaggressions. Um, I love your people. Um, it was just a joke, right? So someone says something that's disparaging to um, another uh, group, um, and uh, it's, you know, oh, it was just a joke, but not understanding the impact that that statement may have had on the individual, right? You're not like the others, right? So again, we see stereotyping and generalizations at work in that statement. Uh, you speak such good English. My best friend is Black. So all of these are examples of verbal microaggressions. But we also have mental health microaggressions as well. Um, and here are some examples, uh, doubting the severity of, of mental illness. Oh, you just need a couple of days off and you'll be okay. You know, um, you probably just need to get some sun or, you know, just go outside, right? So really doubting, um, you know, what the individual is saying in terms of what they're experiencing with their uh, di diagnosed uh, illness or disorder. 
um, not treating people as complex individuals, you know, not understanding that, you know, they're a whole person, they're not just their, um, their diagnosis is really important. And we'll talk about person first language in our communications uh, session. Um, stereotypes about people with mental illness, that they're unintelligent, that they're weak, that they're cold, um, treating people with mental illness like children, right? So all of these are examples of mental health micro, microaggressions. Um, here are some behavioral examples of microaggressions, ignoring a member of a marginalized group during a staff meeting, right? So pretending that folks are invisible, right? So that is a microaggression or mistaking a person of color as a service worker, a white individual waits to ride the next elevator when a person of color is, in, is on it. Um, environmental examples, right? Schools named after white supremacy leaders. Here in Jacksonville, we just renamed several schools. Uh, one of our schools was named Nathan B. Forrest, which was the leader of the KKK. And so we, after much deliberation and protest and, you know, um, community discussion, the name was changed to West Side High, right? So students attending a school where um, they are at a, a, a football game paying homage to um, a KKK is, is considered an example of an environmental uh, microaggression. So in column A, we have statements that are uh, verbal microaggressions. And in column B, we have interpretations of, of those statements. And so I'd like for you to help help us in uh, matching the statements with the interpretations. So you speak English very well. What interpretation aligns with that particular statement? And you can type one, two, three, or four in the chat box. All right. Number three, people of your background are unintelligent. Everyone knows Blacks shoplift. Right, so number four, don't be such a sissy. Number two, and one that ties directly to our mental health community, that's retarded. All right, number one. So all of these are examples of microaggressions, things that people say not understanding the impact of, of words because words have power, okay? So how do we interrupt a microaggression? Um, you're sitting in a meeting and, and someone makes a comment about, for example, the side of town that you live on, right? Um, you ask a clarifying question. You know, in the meeting you mentioned that um, you would never stay on that side of town because of, um, of crime and that everyone in those communities are criminals, right? For example, right? So you ask a clarifying, what did you mean by that? Can you tell me more about that, right? So that's a clarifying question. And come from a place of curiosity and then listen actively and openly. I noticed that. That's a great prompt, a great lead in, you know, so it, it doesn't cause, you know, that, that wall to go up, you know? you know how sometimes we come at folks you know directly and it can, it can come off really abrupt right so i noticed that i noticed that right i noticed that in the meeting that you made a comment about um people in the hispanic community and it made me feel uncomfortable i'd I like for you to just I'd just like to talk about that a little more right so um so that's a great lead in um encourage others to to consider the impact of their words how do you think people feel so that, that's that empathy, right? You know, putting ourselves in other folks' shoes. How do you think people feel when you, when you made that statement, right? Um, name what you're feeling. So affixing a, a name to, um, you know, the emotion. I felt angry. Uh, I felt embarrassed. I felt invisible, right? So actually naming what you're, you're feeling is important in terms of interrupting a microaggression. Um, you want to, you know, of, of course, you know, address it, resolve it, identify next actions. I'd appreciate it if you would next time, you know, do something different, say something different or, you know, that kind of thing. And then another thing that's really effective is referencing organizational policies. Most of us have policies around bullying in our organizations, around discrimination, around hostile work environments. So, you know, you know, we're a work environment that is supportive, that encourages strengths-based conversa 
conversations, right? So, um, so referencing organizational policies is another way to um, interrupt microaggressions. And really what we should be about is micro affirmations. How can we affirm the lived experiences of, of groups that we're working with, right? And so that means verbal acknowledgement, you know, thank you for sharing about your experience at the store. You know, I had not thought about that because I am not uh, a member of your particular racial or ethnic group, or I am not uh, from a particular geographical area. So thank you for enlightening me about that, right? So validating the lived experiences. And this is a way of showing inclusion. It's a way of creating psychological safety within the organization. It's also about recognizing all contributions to the team, right? Making sure that we are, um, you know, uh, affirming individuals who are contributing to the work within the organization. And then I always say, you know, listen, listen, and listen some more, right? So practicing active listening. All right, Rachel, I'll turn it over to you for our case study. Okay, thank you, Selena. Okay, Sarah is a 49-year-old African-American mother of two teenagers. She has a full-time job. Sarah has been referred by her employer for behavioral health treatment due to her inability to perform her job with excessive absences for the past three weeks related to the pandemic stress. Sarah knows that her job is at jeopardy, but she just cannot find the desire to get out of bed and feels worthless. She is ashamed to go to work because she has lost a significant amount of weight and often thinks about just ending it all to find peace. Sarah also states that when she tries to interact with her family, she has difficulty concentrating and has a diminished interest in activities she once loved. Upon receiving the diagnosis of major depressive disorder by the counselor, the counselor states to Sarah, you're so lucky to have a family and a career. Why don't you just get out of bed? The counselor goes on to say, I know as a single mother, you have a lot of stress and you're trying to balance, I know you're trying hard to balance it all. The counselor informed Sarah that as a Medicaid patient, you do know that there's only a certain amount of sessions authorized. These are a few questions about the scenario. One, and feel free to share in the chat. What was inappropriate about the clinical encounter that Sarah had with the clinician? And the second question would be, what would be an appropriate response to the mother's concerns? And the third question is, what are the appropriate next steps to ensure that the mother receives culturally responsive services in a timely manner? Because we know if Sarah had that encounter with the counselor, there's a possibility Sarah may not want to come back. So what could the counselor do um, to provide um, Sarah future services, whether it's um, providing a referral to someone else in the agency, um, soliciting a, an apology. So I see in the chat making assumptions, all of it correct. Clinician was an unprofessional, everything was inappropriate. All the clinician's comments were inappropriate. And so how do we expect Sarah to trust this person who made all of these assumptions about her um, at the first impression. Exactly, we don't. And sometimes, unfortunately, we've been Sarah. We've been in situations where we've been mislabeled or we've been misidentified. And, you know, that person, you know, after they've been corrected in a, you know, professional manner, then they're apologetic. Sometimes, you know, when people come to us, they don't know that we're the provider. They may assume that we're the client or the one that's there receiving services. And I see this is why people don't seek help and support. She should be referred elsewhere for sure. And then if Sarah makes a complaint, um, organizations need to be prepared to not only address Sarah's concern, but also to put in place policies and training to ensure that this doesn't happen again to someone else. I see an apology would have not made the end of this was said better. Mm -hmm. And this is when we think of 
barriers to care and stigma that's associated with seeking support and behavioral health services. Um, because we know that sometimes individuals, when they think of behavioral health services and how um, services were um, created, when we think about psychotherapy, how it used to look, it was you sat across from someone who deemed themselves the expert or an outside you know, body deemed them the expert. They told you everything that was wrong with you and how they were gonna fix you. Um, and sometimes um, we make the misconception that because we are the professional, that we are the fixer. Um, and when we think about some of our own internal flaws, sometimes we have to be fixed before we can provide care. Um, because the reality is if you have clinicians who have not addressed their own bias, that they become the contaminator. And when you contaminate, unfortunately, not only do individuals not feel comfortable with you, they don't feel comfortable with the treatment process at all. And so if you are working with someone who is coming for services, one thing I always did was I asked them, was this their first time ever receiving um, any type of service? And if they told me yes, then I explained what it would look like um, over you know, an extended process, you know, period of time. And then if they told me that they did have services previously, I asked them about their experience because I wanted to know whether or not it was something that was positive or if it was something that was negative. Um, and sometimes people would have a new provider because they moved or relocated or their insurance changed. Um, and then, you know, um, and this, I'm gonna probably date myself when I tell you this, but this was during the days of paper charts. Um, so you would have to get a release to contact agencies to get information about um, the previous care that they received. And that was helpful for me also, because I didn't want people to feel as if I didn't care about um, why they were presenting for care and that I did not do my research. Um, and sometimes we know if individuals have had trauma, it can be um, even more traumatic if they have to relive that trauma um, with a new provider, especially um, if we know that we're only gonna be treating them for a short period of time. I was always honest um, with the individuals I worked with to let them know that we weren't going to be together forever. But, but while we were together, it was going to be effective. And before I did what I call the warm transfer, which was the aftercare referral, I made sure that I knew who they were going to be referred to for aftercare and gave them some insight on that person that would be providing services for them. And we know um, our people sometimes um, just as well as the insurance company. And so I made sure that I aligned them with aftercare that I felt was going to be the most successful for them. If we know um, our person doesn't like to be in large groups and we know certain you know, agencies, we know they're going to be in a group with 60 and 50 people, that's not going to be the best fit. And so making sure that not only do you provide quality services while they're in your care, but you make sure that that aftercare, you put just as much time in the services that you provide as you do into handing them off to um, the next provider because you want someone to provide you that same consideration. There's nothing like, um, you know, like when we call for services, if you call a cable company or anything, or we see a medical provider and, you know, you get a letter in the mail, sometimes even providers don't even tell you they're dropping you, you know, you just get a cold letter in the mail, sorry, but, you know, as of, you know, I will no longer, no longer be your dentist, you know, so you think about, you know, I had a, you know, we think I had a relationship with that provider and I just get a letter in the mail, so when we think about how it feels with us, think about how it feels um, with the persons that we provide care for. So you know if they're gonna be you know, assigned to another person or if we know that you know, our agency is no longer gonna be in network for them, um, having that direct conversation goes farther for me and my previous um, experience than having them receive you know, a random phone call or a letter in the mail because we know that um, even while maintaining um, um, healthy therapeutic boundaries, that clients develop a rapport and a relationship with us. And they look at us as a part of their support system. And so them knowing that it's nothing personal that sometimes, you know, we do have, you know, changes when it comes to who provides care or if they're going to be, you know, if you know in next two or three weeks, you know, they're going to be upgraded or downgraded as far as the level of care, giving them some insight. So it just helps with the transition of care. I see, um, right, there's only so many sessions, a lower level of care. 
And I used to have to, I wore multiple hats because I not only had to do the services, I had to get on the phone and do the pre-certifications with the health plan. So you already know what that looked like. So I literally had a vested interest because I knew that this person needed more sessions. I knew that this person needed to be, you know, you know, stepped up to inpatient just for a level of, you know, just for a few days for maybe an acute period of time for medication stabilization. And then we could, you know, step down and give them, out, you know, outpatient care. And so just um, understanding our own level of frustration when it comes to providing services because as a clinician, as a healer, we can get overwhelmed. Um, and I think about you know us um, having an empty cup. And every time you have an interaction with someone, you have to make sure that you manage your own um, self to make sure that you provide quality care. Um, just for example, I was um, pulled in for crisis response for the Buffalo situation. So what I had to do for my own mental well-being, I don't watch the news. I cannot watch the news until after the implementation of this work because I know if I watch the news, it's going to trigger emotions that I'm going to have a difficult time managing while I'm trying to provide quality care. And so just being in tune with what works for you, um, just being in tune to, I, you know, I say, give yourself office hours. I tell this to Selena all the time. You know, we have to <laughs> give ourselves office hours because we can be burnt out and you don't realize you're burnt out sometimes until it's too late. And you will find that in a lot of the scenarios that we see with some of the clinicians, they're overworked, you know, sometimes they're even underpaid, but we also have to make sure that we don't allow what we're um, experiencing to bleed over into the care that we provide. So managing ourselves before we manage someone else is critical. When you're on the plane and they give you the um, emergency steps to take, they don't tell you to put the the mask on your pat your, your, on your your next to your um, right or your left first. They tell you to put the mask on yourself. And so when you think about providing quality care, you have to ask yourself: Is my mask on, and is it adjusted properly before you can go in and provide services to someone else? Thank you so much, Rachel. And another thing that I think about with this encounter is the importance of the inclusion of family and youth voice. You know, all of our organizations should have some type of family advisory uh, committee board to give us feedback on the quality of the services that are being delivered. Um, oftentimes, we're collecting satisfaction data and community um, engagement data, and we're doing nothing with it, right? We're not um, examining it to determine, you know, where are the gaps, you know, at each decision point are we doing what's best for the youth and families that we're serving? So, um, you know, while we are focused on being culturally humble um, at the micro level or at the individual level, it's important that also we think about the organizational and systems levels as well. And yes, self-care is, is preservation. So in the words of Audrey Boyd, it's so important for, for us as we do this work. Yes. Thank you for that. So we'd like to conclude with the RESPECT model, which is a tool to help us remember how to provide um, culturally responsive care. Uh, the R is for RESPECT. And so it's really important that as we're working with our families that you know our nonverbals and our verbals are aligned. A lot of times we're saying one thing, but our nonverbals are, are not uh, congruent with what we're saying. So it's important that we are demonstrating that respect as the family defines it. So sometimes we're following their lead. Um, secondly, the E is for explanatory models. And so this is where some of the uh, cultural assessment tools come in and our strengths-based assessment are really helpful, you know, understanding the origin of, um, of mental illness as the individual defines it, um, understanding uh, how they uh, perceive certain problems as it relates to mental illness. Uh, the S is for social cultural context. So this goes back to really understanding who the individual is and who are they in the context of their family. So we've spoken a lot about, um, you know, culture in terms of race, ethnicity, SOGI, um, immigrant status and so forth, but there's also family culture, right? And uh, who is the decision maker in the family, right? It, it may be grandma, it may be an elder in the family, 
right? So understanding the social cultural context and also the ecological context in terms of where the family is living and how the built environment is impacting their decision-making. Uh, P, power, acknowledging power differentials between uh, our families and, and the professional. The E is for empathy, expressing verbally and non-verbally our concerns uh, and, and demonstrating that through uh, making sure that we follow through on what we say we're going to do when we're working with families. Concerns and fears, eliciting information about uh, apprehensions or concerns that, that the family may have about treatment, about the initiation of treatment, about what to expect. A lot of times we just kind of, you know, go into uh, our plans without really preparing uh, the family for what's what's next, right? Um, and then finally, what, what Rachel has really uh, expressed so well in this scenario is the importance of the therapeutic alliance, the T, the trust, uh, that is not always inherent, right? So sometimes the trust has to be earned. And so uh, taking the time to uh, really connect and to um, understand who the family is and, and where they're coming from is so important. So take this respect model uh, with you as we conclude our webinar session. So this is our stoplight, and this is just a way for us to think about what you've gained from our webinar today. Uh, the red is for what will you stop doing. The yellow is what will you continue doing. The green is for what you will start doing. So if you want to just type in the chat box one of the uh, colors, the stop, the continue um, and start. We'd love to hear from you. And then we also uh, have a, an opportunity for questions if you have questions for, for Rachel and myself. And thank you all for your active participation today. Yes. We really appreciate you uh, interacting in the chat box and uh, sharing your experiences and being responsive to the content that we've shared today. We have some good ones in the chat. Active listening. Yes. Yellow active listening. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Wonderful presentation. Can't wait for the other two. Thank you so much. You. Continuing to learn everything that I can to support the individuals that, that I support. Yes, absolutely. Okay. We have some resources here for you as well. This is our contact information. If you need to reach out to Rachel or myself with additional uh, questions or, or resources, we'd be glad to um, share that information with you. Uh, the PowerPoint will be available as well as the uh, as well as the recording. Where can we find the studies? The Black Caucus. I'd love to. Okay, so the um, Sound the Alarm report. We can definitely uh, send that out. Thank you so much for your time, multiculturalism, understand acceptance of cultures, appreciate the multiple modalities. Okay. This was excellent. Thank you all so much. All right. Jessica Kelly, is there anything else that you'd like to share before we close out the webinar? And thank you all again for mm -hmm. your support. Everyone have a wonderful Yes. Selena and Rachel, thank you so much. This discussion was just so rich. Thank you so much.